big dreams. I, I, there was, there was a sea of, of humanity, and you know? I just know that I was performing for them, and I was singing for all of these. It seemed like millions of people. Towards the end of my dream, I used to dream this regularly when I was a child. I was acclaimed the greatest, um, not performer, the words were the greatest singer on earth. And um, I used to dream that constantly. For many years, Marvin sang only in church. Even as a child, he would have the church in an uproar. It gave Marvin confidence in his singing. But things weren't easy at home. Marvin's father was tough and tyrannical. And although Marvin found joy in the companionship of his brothers and sisters, he was constantly getting in trouble with the old man. Ziola, Marvin's little sister, said one house rule was never to touch their father's hairbrush. But Marvin couldn't leave it alone. Like clockwork, Marvin Sr. would come home and find his hairbrush not where he'd left it and give Marvin a beating. Beatings were not unusual in the gay household. Marvin got a lot of whippings. But what he found more embarrassing was his father's bizarre behavior. Years later, Marvin confessed to his biographer, David Ritz, that his father used to dress in woman's clothes. Marvin never understood it, but it caused him shame and created a sexual insecurity that haunted Marvin his whole life. To get away from the conflicts at home, Marvin quit high school and enlisted in the Air Force. I fraudulently, fraudulently enlisted into the armed forces, the Air Force, actually. I did a horrible stint in the Air Force. It was terrible. I, I got an honorable discharge under general conditions in Section 214, something about unable to adjust to regimentation and authority and good riddance or something. I don't know. I remember when I enlisted, I spoke uh, to the enlisting officer in, at great length about um, going in special services so that I could perform, you see. At least I can sing and play music and do my number. Well, it didn't work out so much. So good anyway. So we left and uh, we... I came back to Washington and uh, we, we hooked up with Harvey Fuqua. Harvey Fuqua became a mentor and a friend. He was the founder of a group called the Moon Glows. Marvin idolized Harvey and was thrilled when Harvey asked him to join the band. In 1959, 19-year-old Marvin Gaye left home and headed to Chicago with Harvey and the Moonglows. He said he'd signed on with Harvey for life. After a year of small-town club dates, the Moonglows ended up in Detroit. It didn't take long for Harvey Fuqua to realize his own best singing days were behind him, but Marvin Gaye had a brilliant future. Harvey took Marvin under his wing and introduced him to a young record producer, a man who would change Marvin's life. The man was Barry Gordy Jr., the president of a new record company called Motown. Motown wasn't much more than a little local label then, but a big change was going to come. Barry Gordy met Marvin in 1960 at Motown's Christmas party. Gordy noticed Marvin playing some jazzy chords on the piano, which impressed him. Then Marvin started to sing, revealing a soft, soulful voice. Barry heard... <coughs> Heard me playing it at the piano, and um, and um, he came over and he said, um, I think I, I, he, I, if I can recall, he said something to the effect that um, I, I like that melody, and uh, can you do something else with it or something like that? And he wanted me to change some chords, and I was had a bit brief argument with him about why I thought it should remain the way I wrote it. Barry Gordy wanted to sign Marvin Gaye on the spot. Feeling a bit overwhelmed, Barry left Marvin to his piano and joined the other party guests, but all he could think about was Marvin Gaye. A short time after that, Marvin signed with Motown. So began one of the most successful and complicated relationships in Motown history. The label became Marvin's college. During the early 60s, the talent roster of Motown included Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Mary Wells, the Supremes, 
The Four Tops, The Temptations, Martha and the Vandellas, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Tammy Terrell and Little Stevie Wonder. And there were great songwriters, such as Holland Dozier Holland, Ashford and Simpson, Norman Whitfield, and Barrett Strong. It wasn't long before Marvin Gaye joined that pantheon. It wasn't long until Marvin Gaye was Motown's brightest star. Ain't no 